Be me, GMing Godbound, a game where the PCs are demigods. Be not me, PCs. <laughs> PC number one, Lynn, is bound to the domains of death, fertility and passion. PC number two, Optromics, is bound to the domains of endurance, might and shapeshifting. PC number three, Esri, is bound to the domains of dragons, endurance and protection. PC number four, Alistair, is bound to the domains of fire, time and sorcery. PCs have embroiled themselves in an ongoing war in a land known as the Oasis States. Think fantasy ancient Egyptian. Almost everyone lives in mountain-sized pyramid cities that were built thousands of years ago because the surrounding desert is completely inhospitable and these are basically the only places that are safe to live. By the time PCs arrive, the enemy, a race of shape-shifting machines from another realm of creation, had captured all but the capital city. PCs arrived in time to save the capital and have been pushing back against the invaders, slowly recapturing the pyramid cities. Esri receives a message from her mother, an ancient dragon known for being a powerful schemer, saying, we need to talk. It's never good when you get a message from your ma going, we, <laughs> we need, need to talk. talk. Yeah, that's, that's, that's you just asking for baller there. <laughs> you know, like, helps, like, it really is a lot worse, seeing as her dragon as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. like, that lumps it up to 10. Or you don't just get a grind and you get burnt. <laughs> <laughs> this was an adventure hook for later, since the war seemed to be wrapping up. But Esri's absolutely terrified of her mother for backstory reasons, so she decides she needs to go talk to her mum now. Lynn and Alistair decided to tag along because they think it'll be fun to have a vacation in the middle of a war. I decide not to point out how dumb this is because I don't think it's my job as a GM to prevent my players from making mistakes. Only Optronics decides to stay behind. Now, some context here. The player should recently obtained a powerful artifact that the enemy general, a powerful sorcerer who, unbeknownst to the players at the time, was actually being possessed by an eldritch abomination, was looking for. Esri had stashed the artifact in her hoard because she had a divine ability that prevented anyone from stealing from her hoard. Alistair had also used his time abilities to make it so that he got a full round's action if anyone tried to take the artifact. Time would freeze and he'd get a full round to act as if he were standing right next to the thing, even if he was miles away. Anyway, Esri, Alistair and Lynn all leave, heading to a location that was three countries away. Not as bad as it sounds because Esri's divine flight enabled her to make the trip in half a day, but half a day is a long way away when you're fighting a war. Optronics stays behind to man the garrison. Is this a point where you, someone says, don't split the party? Yeah, don't split the party. <laughs> don't split the party, guys, please. And the PC's mortal champions are also there. They're decently strong mortal adventurers, but they can't compare to the might of a demigod. The enemy general, Apollyon, who had a spy within the PC city, learns that three-fourths of the enemy's generals have left and won't be coming back anytime soon. So he uses his magic and borrowed divine powers from the entity possessing him to mobilise his armies over the course of a day. Apollyon has his armies attack from the north, while he approaches with a small strike force of his powerful lieutenants from the south. Optronics sees an army approaching from the north and rallies the garrison, charging out with half of the mortal champions to meet the army on the field of battle. The two armies clash. One side is comprised of mostly humans with the towering titan of shape-shifting steel as their leader. The other is a horde of automata, constructed for the sole purpose of conquest and aided by a handful of Apollyon's monstrous experiments. Zombies. <laughs> I let the PCs who are on vacation play as their mortal champions so that they have something to do in the fight. The battle is fierce. Optronics has spent a good chunk of his effort, the resources that powers his divine abilities, and the champions who went into battle are all gravely injured. Suddenly there is an explosion from the south side of the city. Apollyon has used a powerful spell to blast the gates open. Optronics uses every trick he can to boost his speed, but he's five turns away. Those five turns are carnage. The PCs play as the normal champions inside of the city, but it's a losing fight. They might be heroes, but they are fighting against the avatar of an ancient god and his personal entourage. Mortal champions make valiant last stands. Allies make the choices to either stand and fight or flee. 
and the garrison inside the city is butchered by the eldritch machine men that are rampaging through the streets. Optronix finally arrives and tries to save what lives he can, but the damage is already done. He manages to save a handful of champions, then chases after Apollyon. Apollyon's minions intercept him, delaying Optronix even further as Apollyon makes his way to the royal treasury, the place where Ezri has built her hoard and the location of the artifact he seeks. Optronix finally fights his way through to Apollyon, but he's a turn too late. Apollyon, knowing that he can't steal from the horde, does the only sensible thing. He casts a massive disintegrate spell in order to destroy it. Enough mundane wealth to build a new pyramid city is reduced to dust in the blink of an eye. Only the artifact, which is of divine construction, survives the spell. As Optronix charges towards Apollyon, the evil sorcerer swaggers up to the artifact and reaches out for it, a triumphant grin on his face. Alistair's spell triggers. Alistair has one round to act, in which he may act and perceive things as if he's standing right next to the artifact. He knows he doesn't have enough power to kill Apollyon in one blow, and even injuring him is out of the question, since Optronix wouldn't be able to finish him off by himself. Worse, if Apollyon gets his hand on the artifact, he'll have unimaginable power at his fingertips. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but I just want to talk to you about our new affiliate, Reroll. Reroll is a D&D 5th edition character builder app. Now, everyone needs a character sheet app for a tabletop game, but what makes Reroll stand out above all the rest is its character art. I personally find the character art really, really cool. It has this beautiful retro pixel art aesthetic, and they are continually adding new races and items, so you can customise it whatever way you want. They currently have 14 supported races, over 150 weapons, and over 400 pieces of armour you can mix and match from to really make your character come to life. And the best part, you can have your own little cute companion, like a little baby penguin, a flying kitty, a stupid looking pug, or my personal favourite, a little corgi. And the best thing about Reroll, it has a free version with limited character art, so you can try before you buy and see if you like it or not. We personally think it's an amazing app that will just improve your overall enjoyment of tabletop role-playing games. Reroll is on Apple, Android, Desktop, and if you use our coupon code NECKBEARDIA at checkout, you get 10% off. It's a great affiliate that we think you guys will love, but enough of that. Let's get back to the video. Alistair decides to take a gamble. He doesn't need to win the battle. Just make sure that Apollyon doesn't get his hands on the artifact. The artifact is very useful to the party. But in the heat of the moment, the important thing is making sure Apollyon doesn't have it. So Alistair casts the Trumpet of Far Utterance. This is primarily a communication spell that allows the caster and a target of their choice to perceive images of each other and communicate over vast distances. However, it has another, less stable function. You can attempt to pass physical objects between yourself and the person you're talking to. There's a 25% chance that the object becomes lost at a point between yourself and the person you're communicating with. Alistair is in the same room as Esri, three countries away, half a day by god dragonflight, and more than enough distance to keep the artifact safe from Apollyon. Even if the artifact gets lost, it'll end up somewhere hundreds of miles away from their enemy. Alistair, acting as if he's standing next to the artifact, casts the trumpet of far utterance and hands the artifact off to Ezri. Fortunately for the Pantheon, the artifact is not lost as part of the teleportation. Apollyon watches his prize vanish from right under his nose in a blink of an eye. He is furious. He uses a divine smite to obliterate the entire treasury chamber, blowing the roof of the Pyramid City. Does the pyramid have a roof? Maybe, a kind of, I don't point. know. Does it fly off like a rocket? Yeah. <laughs> I've never thought about that before. It turns into the Illuminati. flies <laughs> away. Blowing the roof off the Pyramid City and nearly killing a wounded Optronix in the process. Apollyon transforms into a massive steel dragon and flies back to his fortress in order to plot his revenge. The city is burning. Half of its army and its heroes lie dead in the streets. And the one demigod who stayed to protect it lies bleeding on the floor. But the day is technically saved. Esri, Alistair and Lynn's decision to go on their trip set the entire war effort back months. 
while their divine miracles allowed them to resurrect some of the more intact champions and replenish the armies. Morale was shaken and the people had less trust in gods who claimed to defend them when it became apparent that there wasn't a good reason for them to fly off during the middle of a war. This incident in particular drove a wedge between my players and I. They were very mad at me for letting them make such a blunder in the first place without so much as a warning them. Oh, no, 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 honestly, that's the player's fault. It's I don't the player's know. fault? They made the mistake of wanting to go on a fucking holiday. Yeah, I know, Let them go. on here, a holiday trip. <laughs> like, I, 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 the players should know the stakes. Yeah. You know what I mean? They should know the stakes. I maintained, and I still maintain to this day, that it's not my responsibility to keep the PCs from doing something stupid. Yeah, no, it's complete. Yeah. Like, the DM, <laughs> no, you're never going to stop no. players from doing something stupid. Players need to think their actions through and can't expect the GM to hold their hands every step of the way. They were level 6 by this point. Godbound's levelling system goes from 1 to 10, so they had more than enough experience to know what was and wasn't a good idea. I also pointed out that it was their own quick thinking that allowed them to achieve a Pyrrhic victory, but they weren't interested in that silver lining. The game fell apart a few months later, and I'm only still in contact with Esri and Lin's players. I think that this story stands as a testament to the extremes of player actions, incredible stupidity that threatens to derail the entire campaign, as well as true ingenuity and heroism that can pull even a seemingly hopeless situation back from the brink of failure. I hope you enjoyed. I really enjoyed I, I thought like I was banging. Yeah. I thought it was really But cool. no, the DMs... No, the DM was... Or the GM completely right with that. Oh, yeah, completely. You don't, um, especially if, like, it only goes from level 1 to 10, so a pretty like, fucking high level. you're level 12. Yeah, from you're pretty systems. fucking high level. You, the, the DM shouldn't have to hold your hand. No, they really shouldn't. And, like, you know, like, let's be honest, players do stupid stuff all the time, but we enjoy doing stupid stuff all the time. Yeah. But, like, there's one don't thing... Don't get pissy about it yeah. whenever you make a bad move. And, like, honestly, there is something about player ingenuity that yeah. has to be said. It know. was quick thinking, like... It was quick thinking, and it was pulled off very well. And it, I think it made the story, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. Like, you know, would anyone have cared about the story if it was like, yeah, they all died, some blahs. End of. Or, um, yeah, all the players decided to go on holiday to go see their mum, and uh, they came back and everything was burnt. The yeah, grind, yeah, pretty much. Well, guys, we were actually going to do the rest of this thread today, but that story took up quite a long time. Yeah, I, so I, we're going to keep it, it. It deserves to be a standalone. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's story, a good story, and it does deserve the standalone. However, there is some really good, really good stories, story. so we're going to do it tomorrow, for, yeah, or the next day, or you know, probably tomorrow. We'll, in the we'll near do the future. the rest of the thread. So, if you like this type of thread. Stay. <laughs> <laughs> Hit that notification bell. And then smash the- that like button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see that? See that? Oh, smash that like button. Button actually makes me cringe. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but no, I like, hope you guys enjoyed this one. We'll be good at doing stuff similar to this tomorrow. So if you enjoyed this, definitely stick about. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.